well, thanks, first of all, for the invitation. And uh, we are, of course, very sorry that we're not in Mexico. In fact, uh, over here it's very snowy. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's better over there. Uh, also, uh, I see uh, some familiar faces uh, at the, the front row, so it would have been good to catch up. And uh, for those that we don't know, it would have been good to, um, to get to know each other. Well, that has to be uh, another time, unfortunately. So uh, you are uh, you far outnumber us. We're just the two persons here. So we'll we move. We are going to hide behind our presentation now. Um, let me see if I can. Hopefully, it will come up now. So you can still see uh, our faces, is what we look like. Uh, what we will do is we will <laughs> present uh, re a, short, a short history of how we get, came to uh, uh, implementation of adaptive survey design at Statistics Netherlands. So the, the talk will uh, consist of two parts. The first part I, uh, that I will do, I will explain a little bit about the background, uh, uh, how we went from theory to practice uh, in a way. And then the second part will be by my colleague uh, Case, and he will uh, explain an application that uh, went into the uh, field uh, yeah, about one and a half year ago. And uh, hopefully there's time for discussion. Um, so I'll move to the first uh, part, which is the, uh, the, the part where we were explaining how we, how we, how we got to uh, adaptive survey design at Statistics Netherlands. So I realize we are the, the, the first talk of the seminar. But I, I, I do assume that you are familiar with the, the topic of adaptive survey design because it's the whole seminar is about the topic. Uh, basically, adaptive survey design is interesting because it differentiates effort to different units in your sample uh, because they might be of uh, interest to you in terms of response or data quality. So you would treat them differently because they have different value to you. Uh, obviously, such a... Um, a implementation requires flexibility. It's not uh, it's so easy to really implement such a, uh, a design. So I, I will basically I will basically go through uh, a number of the key elements that, this, as I can see it, um, are, play a role in adaptive survey design. So perhaps the the most important part is you cannot do anything to learn something about your sample either frame or administer data, or it could be paradata, it could be previous waves of a certain functions. You need to be able to, to, uh, to say which treatment is better. And then there needs to be some sort of strategy, so how to choose your treatments. Uh, in other words, how to get to the highest quality given your budget, or, or vice versa. So uh, let me explain first the context at Statistic Netherlands because that's it might be different from your from your context, but it's for us it's actually the way it's, it, it it drives our uh, implementation. So for now we only look at, at person or household surveys. We always uh, in uh, in advance of data collection determine the number of faces. It's not something we do during data collection. We also uh, fix the, the treatments, so it's not the, the, the case that during the elect collection we are going to change our treatments uh, bef without knowing beforehand what, what are the options. We have covariates from uh, frame data, administrative data, and in, in fact in the Netherlands uh, registered data is pretty strong, so we can use a lot of data at, uh, at the start of data collection. Uh, we also distinguish different types of non-response because they are very different in how you would treat them or how you would uh, devote effort to them, so uh, contact or refusals, and uh, um, which is not so easy. We, we, we try to work with uh, quality cost functions that, there's, uh, that we have a consensus about. So the first adaptive survey design pilot that we did uh, goes back about 10 years. So this was a, a pilot that we did connected to the survey of consumer sentiments, which is a uh, survey asked for relatively subjective kind of information uh, from respondents about how they uh, uh, anticipate economy will develop in the coming year. 
So in this particular uh, case, we had a control group, which was the usual uh, single mode design, and we had an adaptive server design group in which we started to differentiate effort based on the variables that you can see on the screen, so age, ethnicity, and so on. Uh, so the treatment varied in terms of modes and in, f in terms of prioritization. So some groups were prioritized earlier than others, for instance. And then we were interested in uh, the, the, the representation, so how, how much variability there is in response rates across all of these groups. So I will come back to that later. But for this purpose, we use so-called R indicators uh, to measure uh, this, this sort of balance or representativeness. And that was our aim. So in the, you can see in the control group, the values are smaller than in the adaptive server design group. That was on purpose because we wanted to have a R indicator uh, as close as, as possible to one. So that was our objective. But at the time when we were doing this, there was no real we didn't have any structured way of doing this. We just we had just sort of a trial and error approach. So this goes back around 10, uh, ten years. Um, since then, a lot of um, uh, things have changed, and I think it's, it's it may be interesting to to, uh, to explain what we've done over the last say ten years. Um, all of this sort of coincided with the, the introduction of online of the online survey mode. So since about 2007 or eight or so, practically all the surveys that we do moved from interviewer to uh, online plus interviewer mode. So they become mixed. So when we started some, some 10 years ago to think about indicators, which is imperative if you do adaptive design, you need to have some goal, some objective. Uh, we, we very quickly realized that we need to think about uh, mode effects and measurement effects because uh, for us, the mode, so the, uh, using telephone, using face-to-face, -face, is probably the strongest uh, 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 treatment uh, that we could do. So, uh, so around 10 years ago, we started to think about how can we, can we include measurement error, measurement effects into decisions about adaptive survey design. And that's, uh, it's very complicated, of course. Then some, at the same time, we started to think about how to optimize these kind of designs. Um, but we, we never really implemented adaptive survey design in, in practice. And the main reason for that was that we didn't have the tools to do so. So we, we didn't have any systems or case management that would allow us to act very quickly uh, or flexible, a very flexible way to these kind of adaptive uh, designs. So in 2015, the, these management systems, they started to, uh, they, they, to evolve, or to, they, they, they were developed up to now, allowing us to, to, to first start working on these kind of designs. At the same time, we, we also realized that we were trying to optimize a survey as a standalone survey. So each time we do the we survey, we, we only think about that one survey and we strongly believe that there's a lot of information in the, in the past and in other surveys. So if you, if you do adaptive survey design, we think you, the, the, the treatments or the, 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 let's say the expected yield of your design could all already be extracted from his, history. Historic. So that's why we went, went to this um, uh, approach where, where we try to incorporate uh, historic knowledge. So since uh, two years ago, we are now for every redesign of a new survey, adaptive survey design is, is, uh, is considered. And, um, okay, long story. Uh, the, the, so one of the first, uh, first steps was to come up with indicators. So we needed something that we could talk about and would say, okay, if we change the design, then, they, then these indicators change too, and we are, we are happy about that. <laughs> they move in the right direction. So, this goes back to a, a, a project called RISC. And uh, so we, we developed a number of indicators that essentially just measure the variation in response propensities across groups. That's, that's what it's doing. And we want to minimize the variation. So uh, Case will also discuss this later on in the presentation, so we will return to this. But what is important is that if you do this, you fix uh, variables in your evaluation. So it's not that we, we, so we have sort of a, a set of variables that we look at all the time. 
and we would evaluate these indicators for these kind of variables uh, with from from year to year or from survey to survey. So to give you some idea, so this is a, for instance a plot that that uh, would be implemented in a, in a, in a, that is implemented in a dashboard. <coughs> So on the horizontal axis, you would see the response rate, and on the uh, vertical axis, the R indicator. And then the diagonal lines, they, they sort of correspond to a fixed coefficient of variation of the response propensities, meaning that uh, if you move along the line, the coefficient variation doesn't change, which we see uh, as, as our objective. We want to have this coefficient variation as, as, uh, as high as, 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 sorry, as small as possible. So this is the ideal value, um, and of course during data collection we would follow uh, the, the, the values and see whether we get any improvement. So ideally we like to get up, to end up at the ideal value, but we, we never do of course. We all, there's always uh, a, a lack of full balance. So the way to, to then try to change the design, because this is just monitoring, is to start looking at, at the variables or the, the, the let's say the, the subgroups that are responsible for most of the variation. And the way we do this is through what we call partial partial indicators. They are um, they focus on variables. And in this particular case, you can't read it because it's in Dutch. You see the variables that we use in the travel survey. So these are all variables related to travel and mobility. Um, on the the, uh, the the, the variables, they have values between 0 and 0 0.5, or 0 0.5 is very bad, so we try to get them as close as possible to 0. And here are the variables. Um, we always compute confidence intervals around them because uh, in, a, in a survey sample, nothing is certain. It could just be coincidence, which you're, uh, you're observing. And then we have what we call unconditional. Uh, values and conditional values where we adjust for the collinearity between variables. So we try to sort of extract the unique contribution of one variable to the, to the overall variation. So for instance, in this particular case, the variable age, you can't recognize it, it's in Dutch, it's the strongest one. This is causing most of the variation. Okay. Well, the, the question that we always uh, get, at least uh, I always get at this, at, at, the presentations like this, so I, I, I figured it would be good to uh, to answer it up front rather than wait to the end. <laughs> um, of course, if you seek a balance, let's say if you seek uh, sort of low variation in response propensities, you might also say, well, we save all of the effort, we will do this in the estimation stage. We use the same variables that you uh, monitor for uh, uh, representativeness and we just include them in a model afterwards and we're done. Of course, that is, uh, that is uh, a very legitimate uh, criticism. So in the past, we've tried to uh, find examples that it's not true. So this first study that is mentioned here, it is in fact a study of 14 studies, in which we tried to figure out if uh, ba more balanced designs had a smaller bias, even after adjustment. And in, this, in these 14 data sets, we found this is true. So this was for us it was empirical evidence that it's, uh, it's at least useful. But even if you don't believe in, in this balancing uh, uh, attempt, in terms of efficiency of your survey, it's still uh, better to have low variation in your adjustment weights. So even if you don't believe in this, from a variance point of view, it might still be useful to have a, a more balanced um, response. And that's also something that uh, a lot of authors have have shown in, uh, in, in recent papers. Well, we also there's a recent paper where I tried to find out what are the theoretical conditions under which adaptive survey design would be effective. But it's, it's, it would go too far here to explain this. Um, now, this, the second step is, okay, now we have some indicators so we were very happy in the, until 2010, 2011 that we had a set of indicators. And then we got again a bit frustrated because um, modes do not just affect cost or response, but they also affect answers. Or, so they affect measurement error in, in survey statistics. And since we were moving at a big scale to multi-mode surveys, 
we thought we have to think about this impact. Uh, we have to think about the impact. Um, so we, we, we came up with two options. One would be to focus on a single key statistic and then follow the effects of the different designs on that one uh, survey statistic. So this is option one. So for instance, in a labor force survey, you could look at the unemployment rate, which is the most important uh, statistic. The other option, as we called it at the time, is sort of like response style propensities. Doesn't exist, the term. It's a, sort of something we we called it. We try to estimate the propensity that a certain sample unit, when responding, will search, show certain behavior. Something like uh, a non-response on items, fast responding or uh, unreporting, for example. So I'll briefly explain the two options. There's not so much time. Uh, the first option, we looked at the unemployment rate in the labor force survey. So um, unemployment rates are, uh, are important statistics. They are used uh, a lot. What you see in this particular table is a lot of information you see nine strata, so there's nine groups in the population that were identified by the labor force survey department as important. And on the rows, you see, uh, if I count right, you see nine sort of designs. <clears throat> and the designs all vary in how they employ modes. So there's a web design, there's a KT design with two uh, call schedule, two call days, there's a KT with two plus call days and so on. It's too much detail here, of course. But it's important is that we measure the method effect relative to a face-to-face -face survey, which is our benchmark in this case, because that was the traditional mode of the survey. So you can see there's variation. Some strata show a lot of uh, effect, others don't. And of course, we like the effect to be small. So that's, that was our goal. On the other side of the, the picture, you have, of course, you have the cost. I mean, uh, it's good to have a face-to-face -face survey, but it's a lot more expensive than an online survey. So we tried to estimate the cost per stratum, per uh, strategy, and you can see, uh, for instance, in the first row, uh, the, the, web, the web designs are only about three to 4% of the face-to-face -face cost, which is a huge uh, gap. So here is sort of the, the playing field to, to start optimizing. I'll get back to that optimization later. Um, the second option was to start looking at uh, probabilities that respondents will show certain answering behaviors or, or response styles, if you, may, if you could call them. So in this particular case, we looked at what we call motivated underreporting, meaning that uh, the respondent doesn't give information on all the jobs that he or she has. So if you do the LFS, you will, you will learn very quickly that if you have more jobs, you will have to do a lot more answering. In fact, per job, you will get questions. So it's, um, in a way, it's, it's beneficial not to, to report too many jobs. So in this particular example, we, we try to estimate that proportion of underreporting based on administrative data about jobs. So in this table, you would see a, um, the, the, the response rate without and with underreporting for different strategies, so different constraints on the R indicator, different constraints on the number of visits. So um, this, is, this is how we try to optimize this. Of course, there's a, there's a whole paper behind this, so if you're interested, we can share that with you. Um, then I move to the, to the first step, which is probably the hardest one. It's also, methodologically speaking, the most interesting one, so you, you can uh, think about this for a long time. Uh, is the optimization, so how to optimally assign different treatments to different uh, groups. So if you, if you look at the literature, there are basically four uh, approaches that people have uh, tried. One is just what I would call trial and error. You just do something that you think is best. Then there's the, the probability sampling with quota, case prioritization, and a real mathematical optimization model. So there's, um, there's not enough time to go in all of these uh, 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 cases. But what is interesting that for the particular example that I showed you earlier, so the LFS, we computed a optimal allocation for each of these uh, strata um, based on that, a mathematical optimization 
the problem. So you, each column adds up to one, so you can see the <coughs> allocation probabilities to each uh, strategy for each stratum. Well, a lot of numbers here. Um, you can see that, uh, in fact, there's only uh, one stratum, stratum four, that's still almost assigned to face-to-face. -face. It's the only one, so all other strata are assigned to a mix. Okay. So step four is, of course, the tools. Uh, this was the, the for us, for a long time, it was, it was, it was not uh, feasible to, to do adaptive survey design other than in experiments or in simulation. If we would do it in production, it would be too, too, uh, too hard, too, too, too uh, uh, risky. So since 2015, we have the, a program called Phoenix, which may be a bit a negative name, I would say. But um, of course, the end is always uh, good if you're Phoenix. So um, right now, we are, we are changing surveys uh, in that new uh, 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 survey environment to adaptive designs. Okay, the, the final step that I, I like to present, but I don't have that much time, is what we call Bayesian adaptive design. So in Bayesian adaptive design, we start to, we start to um, assume that all parameters of interest are actually random variables themselves, so we um, try to infer from the past what, is, what are their values, and we update these values during data collection. That's basically how it works. Um, it's not as, uh, as easy as it, as it sounds, of course. Um, in, in, in reality, we have all these models with regression coefficients and, and uh, reg uh, parameters that are now uh, random and that we update uh, constantly. Um, the, the tricky part, of course, is to come up with prior distributions. So either from expert or from historical data. So that's where a lot of research is going right now. So uh, if you're interested, uh, please send me an email about this. So our conclusions from the Bayesian analysis are that they are actually have, do have a lot of added value if the historic uh, information is uh, strong, which is of course what you would expect. But that prior elicitation should be done a bit conservatively. Uh, always add a bit more variance to your priors, and, um, because uh, they are, the priors are always based on a data that is uh, old. <laughs> okay, so the conclusions, and then I'll move uh, to case, is that for us, uh, we, we learned that adaptive survey design demands uh, flexible systems. It also demands for consensus about what, where should the survey go? What is the objective? And that's not such an easy uh, uh, question to answer. In our case, the survey mode is uh, probably the, the, the main feature which that we adapt. Um, and in all what, that we do, we focus mostly on the longer run yield. So we, we try to avoid to tweak too much during data collection, tweak from one way, from one year to the other. So we, we avoid reacting to very incident, to incidents. Okay. So now we'll move to, we'll move to part Part two. Okay, thank you, buddy. <coughs> so, the second part of this presentation starts with a short introduction on why it is decided to apply adaptive survey design to the health survey in Statistics Netherlands. Next, a few methodological aspects and assumptions are highlighted. And finally, the introduction of adaptive survey design in the health survey will be elaborated. The aim of adaptive survey design is to get a better balanced response by putting different effort in different groups of the population. As we have seen from the previous part of this pre presentation, adaptive survey design is effective in improving survey results or in reducing survey costs. In the methodological part, the four elements of adaptive survey design are discussed. That are quality and cost criteria, stratification, design features, and optimization. And this is done from an operational perspective. 
following assumptions are made. The first one is we consider samples that are uh, the sample is a simple random sample of fixed size n, and this is the case with the health survey. The second one is that the response follows the so-called random response model in which person K responds with response probability rho K and each rho K is only known to person K. And the third one is that answers are independent of the observation mode this means that mode-specific measurement bias is absent and can be ignored. This is a simplification, as such biases are conjectured to exist and should be incorporated in the design decisions. The aim of the survey is to estimate population means of several target variables. An estimator for the population mean is the response mean. However, in general this estimator is biased unless all response probabilities are equal. The bias can be approximated by the formula shown. Here y denotes the target variable, r is Pearson's correlation coefficient and s is the population standard deviation. Since the absolute value of Pearson's correlation coefficient does not exceed 1, an upper limit for the bias can be given by the product of the coefficient of variation of the response, response probabilities and the population standard deviation of the target variable as y. Since we cannot influence the population standard deviation SY, the aim of reducing non-response bias can be achieved by minimizing the coefficient of variation of the response probabilities. It is assumed that a SQL mixed mode design is used with computer-assisted web interviewing KWI, as the starting mode. The follow-up of KVU non-response is done through interviewer modes and here it is assumed that the follow-up is done by computer-assisted personal interviewing KP. And the design feature to adapt is the KP follow-up. In the sequential mode strategy, all sampled people are first asked by letter to participate in the survey by completing a questionnaire on internet. People who have not responded to this request after no more than two reminders are visited at home to conduct an interview. The observation strategy of the face-to-face -face interviews is adjusted as illustrated in the pictures. To reduce the variation of response rates, more KP is used for groups that respond badly via the internet, see group 1, than for groups that respond well via the internet, for instance group 2. This may lead to smaller variation of response rates, as can be seen in the red parts of the picture, and the ratio of the target groups in the response may be more similar to the ratio of the target groups in the population. This may, however, be at the expense of the overall response rate. The identification of so-called target groups is carried out using cluster analysis. People are divided into target groups based on personal characteristics in such a way that within each group there is little variation in response behavior per mode and between two groups there is a big difference in response behavior for at least one mode. After the clustering, the coefficient of variation of response probabilities must be minimized under constraints 
on budget, response numbers or rates, and sample sizes per month of observation. And the solution of the problem contains the KV sample size, the KP sampling fractions per target group, and an estimate of the coefficient of variation. Now we come to the application of adaptive survey design in the health survey of 2018. First, I will tell something about our health survey. The aim of the Dutch health survey is to provide as complete an overview as possible of developments in health, medical care and lifestyle of people living in the Netherlands. The sampling design is simple random sampling. Each month about 1500 people are selected. The observation starts with internet, KWI, and the follow-up mode is the personal interviews, KP. The desired number of respondents is 9,500 per year. Clustering is done with a classification tree. People are divided into groups based on personal characteristics such as ethnicity, urbanization, age, income, and what else can be seen on this page? Clustering was carried out with data from the results of the health survey from January till June 2017 through the R package R part with which the following classification tree was generated. Since you cannot read this slide, I will skip it and I will summarize the results. Four characteristics are selected and merged into larger groups. The first characteristic is ethnicity and it is divided into two groups, namely Western people that are the Netherlands residents and migrants with a Western background. And the second are the non-Western people which consists of the migrants with a non-Western background. The second is age, is divided into the four, into four categories. Income, for income we used the standardized disposable household income and the classification is into two categories with, that, with the low income category consisting of the lowest 20% and the high income category consisting of the remaining 80%. And four is the degree of urbanization, and that is reduced to two categories, namely the very strongly urban and all the others. Bottom left on the slide, the first six target groups partition the Western people. Here, urbanity equals one means very strongly urban and urbanity equals two up to five means the union of the remaining categories. Bottom right, the non-Western migrants are divided into three target groups by age. This table contains per target group the estimated KV response rate and the estimated KP response rate. Well, observe that the KV response rates are lowest for groups 7 and 8, that are the non-Western people aged 12 years or older. And next for groups 4 and 2, that are the Western people with a low income aged 12 years or older. So for these target groups, high follow-up sampling fractions are expected. The problem to be solved is the following. Minimize the coefficient of variation of the response probabilities under the constraints that the KW sample size does not exceed 
18,000 people. Two, that the expected response size equals at least 900, 628 people. And that is the number of respondents of the health survey in 2017. And three, that the KP sample size does not exceed 8,039 people. And this number is based on the available on the available budget for personal interviewing in 2018. And four, one KP sampling fraction per target group is applied. From these constraints, it follows that the average resp response rate must at least be 53.5%. The problem is solved with the R package Alabama using the augmented Lagrangian adaptive barrier minimiz minimization algorithm for optimizing smooth nonlinear objective functions with constraints. The algorithm may end up in a local minimum, so different starting values were used and the best solution was, was selected. Well, this table shows the results and in the last line uh, first consider the uh, orange numbers I hope you can see them the numbers uh, from the left to the right in orange the overall KV sample size in this solution is 17,295 and the constraint was that it should be less than 18,000 18,000 the overall KP sample size equals the limit, uh, 8,039. The overall response size also equals the limit, 9,628. And the overall response rate equals 56%, which is higher than needed. For the group with the lowest response, KV response rate, that is group 7, the KP sampling fraction equals 100%, resulting in a total response rate of 44%. This is considerably lower than the required 53.5% and cannot be increased unless other response increasing measures are taken. For the group with the second lowest KV response rate, that is group 8, the KP sampling fraction also equals 100%, resulting in a higher response rate, namely 52%. The next group, group 4, also gets sampling KP sampling fraction 100%, resulting in a total response rate of 42%, which is the lowest of all target groups. And these are the people uh, middle with a middle age and with a low income. The next one, group two, the KP sec selection fraction is 95%, resulting in a total response rate of 56% which is equal to the overall response rate. And for all the other groups, the KP sampling fraction varies from 44% to 71%, and the overall KP sampling fraction equals 72%. Well, here you see some quality measures in which the situa situations without and with adaptive survey design or compared. The use of adaptive survey design causes the overall response rate to decrease, but the variation of the response rates is improving and the ultimate quality measure, the coefficient of variation of the response probabilities, is also improving and therefore there is less bias due to selective non-response. And finally, we looked at the effect of adaptive data collection 
on the survey results. Well, to get an idea of this effect, simulations were carried out using the technique of bootstrapping. To this end, thousand samples with replacement were drawn from the sample of 2016. Each sample has the right KV size and the right KP sizes for per target group. The sample numbers were taken from the sampling design with adaptive survey design for 2018. After waiting the response per sample, the core target variables were estimated. And these estimates were compared with the results of the health survey of 2015 and 2016. What we saw is that most of the survey results with adaptive survey design do not differ much from those without adaptation. But the greatest shifts were found in non-pre-described use of medication and psychologically unhealthy. The picture on the left shows the estimates of non-pre-described use of medication and the picture on the right the estimates of psychologically unhealthy. The blue and red lines represent estimates and confidence intervals for the regular health survey of 2015 and 2016 respectively. Well, if we consider the year 2016, then we see that the proportion of people using non-pre-described medication shifts from 38.1% without adaptive survey design to 39.1% with adaptive survey design. And the proportion of psychologically unhealthy people shifts from 11.1% without adaptive survey design to 12.4% with adaptive survey design. This is the end of our talk. Um, thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience on implementing uh, these adaptive survey designs at the Statistics Netherlands. Um, uh, you give us a wide idea of what you have done uh, to develop and use uh, these kind of designs. And I will want to ask some questions about the first step uh, related to the example to the quality indicators. And I think that will be very useful at INEGI because we are starting uh, studying what kind of indicators we can use to study the non-response. So you were talking about the representativity indicator and also about the bias, uh, some kind of measure for the bias. So in both cases, you are using a probability of non-response. So I wonder what is the recommendation to estimate this kind of probabilities? Thank you for the, for the kind uh, words. Uh, yeah, this end, the, the sound is not so good. We could, we could not discern whether it was a question, but if people have questions uh, and there is time, we could, of course, uh, uh, try to answer some of the questions. I was wondering, uh, what are your recommendations for the, uh, the estimation of the known response probabilities or response probabilities uh, used on, on the quality indicators you presented? The question is how we estimate response propensities? Yes. Well, it, there's, there's a, in fact, it's, 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 a, it's a multivariate analysis. So we, we would, I mean, if you, in the example of the health survey, have a full stratification, uh, then it's easy. You just uh, compute the, the average uh, number of persons responding in the stratum. But then, some of the other examples, we didn't use a main effect model, but uh, uh, sorry, interaction model, but uh, a, a, a more parsimonious model that we would ref probably move to uh, probability regression or logistic regression, these kind, these kind of uh, models. Okay, uh, thank you for
for your answer. I have another question. It's about uh, uh, one assumption you made uh, when presenting the example, and is uh, there is no like the survey votes or answers are independent. Uh, I wonder what what are your suggestions to first to analyze if we we are in this case, and the second is. What are the suggestions when we don't have this kind of assumption? I'm sorry, it was very. I think you asked the question about assumptions, but I must say that we we can't we can't really. We heard only a few of the words in every every sentence. Um, in the example you gave, uh, one of the assumptions you made was to. Um, the answers are independent of the survey modes. So I was wondering how to analyze if we are in this case or what to do when we are not in this case. Yeah, what I think you're asking is about uh, mode effects, so let's say measurement effects on the, the result from the mode, right? Um, yes. That, if that is the question, um, in, the, in the current imp implementations, we're not considering a measurement, so more specific measurement bias, but I think we should. So uh, we're still thinking about how to do this um, in, in, in practical uh, practical settings. So we're not really sure how to do this, but we, we think it's, it's we must do this. Um, but we, I can also say, I mean, uh, if there's any question or, or we would be very happy to answer that by email. So uh, I, I hope our, our email addresses are available. You can. Uh, always send emails afterwards. Okay, I think now the sound is better, so I will ask the audience if they have some questions. Thank you very much for your talk. And I was, I very much enjoyed the fact that you present some, some measures, some numbers, and, and so. But I was very surprised why the Dodge Health Survey the design is a simple random sample. If by simple random uh, test is a simple random sample. In that case, you obviously don't have a stratification and clustering, and that makes it uh, easier for further analysis, like you did classification trees and cluster analysis. So I would like to hear your comments. How is it possible that you have a national survey with a very with a simple design? Thank you. Yeah, a simple random sample. I mean, this this particular case uh, it, it is a simplification. It is true for the health survey that it uses such a design, but of course, uh, other surveys uh, like the health, uh, labor force survey don't use that design. They they are actually stratified. They have unequal probabilities of uh, sampling or inclusion. Um, the way we assess these indicators is always relative to the sample, so we uh, to the population. So we weight by the design weights. That's one thing, uh, the design weights are included in, in uh, estimates of the propensities and so on. But I, I realize that especially for copy or face-to-face, -face, it's very easy to say we're going to allocate uh, resources, but of course these are very regional, so very location uh, specific. So it's not as easy as we say here, that in reality we also, strata, we also look at the, the, the interviewer region. It's like the, the solution to these problems are actually a little more complicated than we show here. I think it's, uh, there is no more questions, so thank you very much again for your participation in this seminar. It, will, it was very, very helpful to, to hear about the experience of another official statistics office, and well, thank you very much. <laughs>